Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. The Haunting at Gladstone Villa My family and I lived at a large property called Gladstone Villa in the former mining town of Bargode in the Carefilly County Borough of the South Wales Valleys in the UK. From 1969 to 1978, we experienced activity that simply defied rational explanation, such as lights going off and on. We witnessed electrical cables being pulled and my grandfather Bill claimed to have had a bottle thrown at him as he entered the main bedroom, missing him by inches. I didn't personally see this myself, but I still recall the time he came from there with a broken bottle in his hands and he told us what happened. There was the occasional sighting, but this was very rare indeed. So rare that in all the nine years I was there, I never saw it once, but I did hear it many times in the bedroom. It's still worth mentioning that my mother Caroline saw it on at least two occasions. There were also regular footsteps heard in the main bedroom every evening. Sometimes during the day, when we'd all be downstairs watching TV, one of us would turn the volume down to hear it more clearly, and my grandfather Bill would point to the ceiling and say, He's by here, and he's by there now, trying to make out where the footsteps were coming from exactly. There were five members of the family that were living at Gladstone Villa. My maternal grandfather, William Higgs, known as Bill to family and friends, a retired miner who worked at the local colliery. He was a short, bald man who liked nothing more than to listen to his country and western LPs, Johnny Cash and Glenn Campbell, and so on. He also liked westerns on TV that starred John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. My maternal grandmother was Rita Higgs. She was a short woman who was a housewife. She was a complete teetotaler, but liked the smoke. She also liked collecting garden gnomes and liked watching soap operas and TV. My mother, Carolyn Dexter, met my father at the local bakehouse in Baldwin Street. She was a day shift regular, and my father worked a night shift. He would stay behind to make her a cup of tea and chat. They dated for three years before they got married on Monday, the 1st of April, 1968. The Beatles were number one with Lady Madonna, very apt. They did not get a place of their own, but they decided to live with my grandparents at Gladstone Villa, which was in Cardiff Road. I was born on the 24th of August, 1969, when everyone was listening to the latest number one in the charts, Honky Tonk Woman by the Rolling Stones. It was soon after that that my mother said the strange things started to happen. I was just a baby. When she said it all started off rather quietly, like small tapping here and there, but nothing too noticeable. But in time, the activity gradually increased. One time, my mother said the family heard a noise, like someone jumping down from the attic and onto the landing. Naturally thinking that someone was trying to break in, they went to see what was going on. When they got there, they found nobody there, but the hatch to the attic was open. Whatever it was eventually occupied itself in the main bedroom, which incidentally was my grandparents' room. It soon made its presence felt by walking around the bedroom and the sound of dragging could be heard. One day my mother went upstairs to that bedroom to get my father up for work so he could get ready for his night shift. When she got there, she was confronted by the side of the ironing board placed on my father's torso as he slept. When he awoke, he was astonished to find the situation he was in. He suspected my grandfather, Bill, was playing pranks, but in time, he knew my grandfather was not responsible for it, and he told his work friends what was going on there, and it got around town that Gladstone Villa was haunted. My parents separated in 1972, and my father left Gladstone Villa. But it wasn't because of what was happening at Gladstone Villa. It was just a breakdown of the marriage. They finally divorced in 1975, and the British band, the Big City Rollers, were number one in the charts with Bye Bye Bay. Again, very apt. It would have been amusing, but for the fact of what was going on there. I was barely two years old, so I have no memory of my father living at Gladstone Villa. But he would come to see me every Saturday to take me to see my paternal grandparents and to the local cinema. Great times, even though the paranormal activity still continued. As I got older, I too witnessed the activity for myself. I actually saw the poltergeist activity for myself. I saw the electrical cables being pulled by unseen forces. 
I saw the lights going off and on, and when my grandfather Bill would play records on the Sunday, as a family did the dinner, it would turn the music off. It took exception to the British band Slade and any religious TV show my grandmother Rita would watch. The local police were also involved. I remember them popping their heads into the attic, hesitating and not going in, but they suggested it was my father playing a prank on the family. A family friend, Mrs. France. She was more of a friend to my grandmother Rita. She was very skeptical when my grandmother told her that Gladstone Villa was haunted. I can still remember Ivy going to the main bedroom, looking around and saying it was vibration from the traffic outside causing it. But she was soon to change her mind when she experienced it for herself. It was then she suggested the local press and a medium. The medium was John Matthews, and when he came to Gladstone Villa, he started by asking the family questions. He then began by challenging the spirit to perform by knocking on the ceiling, and sure enough, it responded by knocking back at him. At some point, John went into a trance to try to make contact with him, but he failed to get a name. He later confirmed the obvious that there was indeed a presence there, and it was an earthbound spirit, and that it had unfinished business. A priest by the name of Graham Jones was called to Gladstone Villa. He blessed the property, and after a few prayers, he duly left, and it was quiet for a few short months after that. No incidents, but it did return, and with a vengeance. And this time it decided to show itself. One evening, my grandfather Bill, my mother Caroline, and I were watching television. My grandmother Rita was reading a book when all of a sudden my mother just so happened to look to her left and she saw the full solid figure of a monk standing by the doorway. We did not see this as we were otherwise occupied, but she later described it in detail as a monk in typical brown habit complete with hood over the head so she didn't see the face. It sounded very much like a 16th century Benedictine monk. Fred Davies was a friend of my grandfather, Bill. They worked together at the local colliery and he would visit most evenings. Fred was a slim man who would wear a flat cap and glasses and smoke homemade cigarettes that hung from his lips when he spoke. He would sit in his favorite chair by the open fire and talk to the family and watch TV with us. One day, Fred was with us in his usual place by the open fire. I was quietly playing with my toys by the sideboard. It was quiet when all of a sudden there was one very loud bang. It was so loud that Fred ducked his head and I ran to my mother for comfort. When it was quiet, we all went upstairs. My grandfather Bill would always be first and I would be last. When we got to that bedroom, we found nothing that could account for the noise. Fred later told us that he ducked his head as he thought it was going to come through the ceiling. Fred told us of another experience he had at Gladstone Villa. My grandfather Bill liked to look out the landing window that overlooked Cardiff Road and into Bargoed Town Center. This time Fred joined him. He said he felt something brush past him. When he looked, there was nothing there. The most frightening experience I had was when I was alone in that particular bedroom. I made sure the light was on. It was very quiet. I was lying on the bed facing the window that overlooked Cardiff Road when I suddenly felt something heavy pounce on the bottom of the bed. I heard the bed springs go just once and I felt the bed bounce. I didn't look straight away, but when I did, there was nothing there. I went downstairs to tell my family and we all went back up. We saw distinctive paw marks on the bed like that of an animal. I later found out that my grandfather, Bill, had a black Labrador dog called Toby who died before I was born. My grandfather, Bill, and my mother, Caroline, claimed to have heard a baby crying, but as I didn't hear that at the time, I took very little notice of what they said. The activity got so bad that my mother, grandmother, and I slept downstairs with the lights on. It was only my grandfather, Bill, who was supposedly brave enough to sleep there. It was then that he himself had yet another experience in there. He told us that he was lying on the bed when all of a sudden he couldn't move. He couldn't even shout out to us to help him. This could well have been sleep paralysis, but he said that he heard something in the room with him. My grandmother Rita had her own experiences. One day she went upstairs into that room to get my grandfather up when she saw the boiler door open wide by itself. She didn't stay there to see what it was, but she rushed out of that room. On another occasion she said that she had a sensation of something pulling from under her foot like she had stepped on his gown. We had the ghost for so long that my grandmother Rita gave it a pet name. She called him Johnny and my grandfather Bill would shout out that name to provoke a reaction, but nothing would happen. 
Ivy Francis' son, Charles, got to hear about what was going on at Gladstone Villa. And he came along with some friends. And with my family's permission, they went into the bedroom. It frightened one of his friends. And to this day, one of his friends still says it was a spooky place. My mother, Caroline, had an operation. And she ended up on crutches to support her. The local nurse would tend to her foot. My mother sat on the chair when the nurse came on a certain day. And the nurse knelt down to tend to her foot and she told my mother not to hold her my mother looked at my grandmother Reed in amazement as she was not holding the nurse at all my mother made her own conclusions that it was johnny the ghost that was trying to hold her in the order for that nurse not to hurt her the only time i heard the ghost being vocal was a time when we were all in the room one of us wanted to use the bathroom and we couldn't get in there my grandfather bill said he's behind there I heard quite distinctly the sound of Gregorian chant, and that was it, nothing more. We left in the summer of 1978 when two local businessmen bought the property, and Gladstone Villa was eventually converted into a small hotel, and its name changed to Red Park Hotel. On the night before we moved, there was one final incident we experienced, as if it knew we were leaving, and it was its way of saying goodbye. My mother, grandmother, and I got ready to go to sleep. The light was still on, and then we heard the doorknob turning as if someone was trying to get in. At first, I naturally suspected my grandfather, Bill, as he was the only one who slept upstairs in that room, and we thought it may have been him playing a prank. I called out to him, but there was no answer, no laugh that would give him away. We then heard our belongings that were packed in the hallway being thrown around. The next day, we asked my grandfather, Bill, if it was him playing a joke on us. He insisted it wasn't him, and to this day, I believe him. I had my 40th birthday at Red Park Hotel in August of 2009 for old time's sake, and it was a female staff that told me about the ghost, and I told them about what happened to me there 30 years before. The staff told me of their own personal experiences, lights going off and on, the odd sighting in room 5, a bride in white was seen, again as with the claims of the baby crying, that made no sense to me at the time. I did a thorough research of the property and the Cardiff Road area and I found some very interesting things indeed. I found out from Bargo Library and local newspaper archives that Gladstone Villa dates back to 1900 and it was named after the former British Prime Minister William Gladstone. I discovered that previous people had lived there. The Kimmet family in 1924, the new married couple Michael and Evelyn Kimmet and a son named Elvin Kimmett. He died at the property just four months old, according to the archives of Cardiff's newspaper, the Western Mail of that year. This explained the baby my mother and grandfather heard in the bedroom. Mrs. Evelyn Kimmett died in 1970, soon after I was born. Maybe this is why the activity all started. I also found that there was a monastery in Baldwin Street where my parents met and worked. And there's a property directly opposite the former Gladstone Villa property in Cardiff Road, dating back to the 16th century. It is now a public house called the RAFA Club. A priest hole is said to be there, but it's sealed up. This explains the monk my mother saw. What I have said here is true. I wouldn't share this if I couldn't possibly back this up. And I have used real names as I have nothing to hide. This property needs to be thoroughly investigated. And it's still there on Cardiff Road, near Cape Philly and Cardiff. The Boy in the Delivery Room I remember the first and last time I saw ghosts was when I was in fourth grade. It was very terrifying when a chubby girl wearing a black dress and waving a black handkerchief was floating right in front of me at the kindergarten room of our school. It was my first and last time I saw one, beyond what my eyes can see. But... Hearing unusual voices and caresses of weird wind never stopped until I reached my present age. It always gave me goosebumps. I'm in my third year at a nursing school and we are having our practicum in the delivery room. I never heard such ghostly stories before in that area of a certain hospital, which I will not mention the name for privacy's sake. It was my first time then when I was there in the delivery room, working a shift from 11 p.m. until 7 a.m. the next day. We only had two patients in the labor room that time, 
At 1 a.m., one of the patients gave birth, and right after the delivery, she was transferred to her desired room at the ward. So me, with my co-nursing students, would remain in our area and monitor the one patient left in the labor room. Everybody was tired, of course, including the staff, and a few minutes after the delivery, everyone seemed to fall asleep. I was the one left awake, cleaning the pad and whatever instruments had been used. I felt weird at that time and was uncomfortable doing my task, but I just ignored it. While cleaning the instruments, I felt somebody walking behind me. I thought it was one of my classmates. So I turned around, but nobody was there. Only a gust of wind that passed through me. Gosh, that felt weird, I told myself. Well, I still continued what I was doing. Later on, I also felt sleepy. It was already 2.30 in the morning. I walked into the labor room to check the vital signs on the one patient left, and I sat on the chair at the corner of the door next to one of the beds in the labor room. I closed my eyes and leaned my head on the wall. Suddenly, something tried to wake me up. I slowly opened my eyes and I saw someone pacing along the labor room. I thought it was the staff nurse giving medicine to the patient, but it wasn't. The figure was smaller than the size of an adult. I tried to figure out who she or he was. Then when my vision cleared, I saw it was a little boy. Even though he was not facing me, I could tell it was a little boy. He was jumping and jumping at the other corner of the labor room, and I was wondering how he got inside. I tried to stand up and ask him, but I couldn't move. Even my fingers couldn't move and no words would come out of my mouth. I told myself, this is not normal anymore. That little boy in a white shirt should not be in here. My heartbeat was very fast and I didn't have any idea what to do. Everybody was still sleeping and I couldn't even cry out for help because I couldn't speak. Again, I felt goosebumps and another weird gust of wind passed through me that made me feel cold and chilly. I told myself, calm down, calm down, pray, pray, pray. And so I did. Then everything shut down after my last prayer. I heard voices around me. I slowly opened my eyes. Then I saw some of my classmates who are awake and they were monitoring the patient. I looked at my wristwatch and it was 5 a.m. It was so weird and scary. I tried not to tell anyone until 7 a.m. I asked my classmates if they felt something that wasn't right in the delivery room. Well, half of them said that they hadn't. The others hadn't noticed anything. Weeks passed and we started working on the next chapter of our studies. And then they put us on the afternoon shift and lucky for us, we didn't have any patients to monitor in the labor room. Later on, our clinical instructors started to discuss some ghostly stories that were attached to the hospital. I kept my mouth shut and tried not to tell anyone about what I had experienced during my last duty. And then one of my classmates talked about some ghostly stories in the area that she had heard from other students. She had heard that there was a spirit of a little boy that was known to play along in the labor room. And the clinical instructors confirmed this story. It was then that I knew for sure that I hadn't dreamt it. I had actually seen the ghost of that little boy. I just didn't know who he was or what had happened to him. The House of the Little People This story was told to me by my dad, and that's why I know it's true. It happened before I was born. My parents had just gotten married, and my uncle as well. My parents were staying with my grandparents until they left for the United States, and my uncle moved to a house just in front of it. These houses were built on an old rice field, and this rice field had witnessed events from World War II. My story begins when my uncle hired a maid to look after their house because they were not there all the time. A few days later, the maid came to my uncle and asked if my aunt called her in the middle of the night. My uncle said no and asked why. The maid said that she had heard what sounded like a little lady's voice calling her name. My uncle did not believe her and said that she might be dreaming. The maid thought she might have, but she wasn't sure. This happened a few times and my uncle as well as my dad just brushed it off thinking that she was just making up a story. Then they came home one Saturday afternoon after finishing a tennis match. My dad, my mom, my uncle and my aunt were shocked when they saw my grandparents talking to a couple of police officers. They asked what had happened and the police said that the maid was found hiding behind my grandparents' refrigerator all freaked out and shouting, They're going to get me! They're going to get me! They asked who was going to get her, 
and she said the little people living in my uncle's house. The maid was eventually taken to the hospital and then released and was brought to their hometown. The doctor said that she had some psychological issues before. And again, this is what my uncle and my parents thought. A few years later, when I was seven and my uncle had moved out of the house, it was rented out to a couple with one child. One day they came to my dad and said that they had locked themselves out of the house. My dad had a spare key and quickly went to the house. He was about to insert the key in the keyhole when the door just slowly opened by itself. He asked the couple if they had really checked that their door was locked and they said yes. My dad now believes that there is something not normal in that house. And who knows if it was what terrorized that poor maid so many years ago. The man in my house. I've lived in the same house for about 15 years now and ever since I was young. My sister and I have encountered some strange experiences. I will share some that happened to me. The first time I became aware that the spirit was in my house, I was 9 or 10 years old. I had a friend over to spend the night and we were in the basement. I went upstairs for a reason I can no longer recall. And on my return down the stairs, I fell. It was only about six stairs that I actually fell down. But I remember distinctly feeling hands on my back and a forceful push. As I lay at the bottom of the stairs, I looked back up to see if my sister or someone else had pushed me. I saw a figure. It wasn't exactly opaque, nor did it have a shape. It just seemed that in this area the background looked less sharp, almost blurry. My friend came around the corner to see if I was okay. When I looked back to see the figure, it had disappeared. The next experience happened a few weeks after being pushed down the stairs. I was home alone and I went to the garage to get a soda. I went into the garage and heard a strange noise coming from the attic. I listened carefully and decided that they had to be footsteps because the noise would move about in the attic. Curious, I called out, hello, and then it stopped suddenly for about a second. Then in what sounded like a burst of energy or rage, the noise trampled toward the attic door. I ran back into the house and out the front door and refused to go home until someone else was there. It wasn't until recently that the being in my house adopted a visual self, or maybe it was just the first time I noticed. He is huge. If he were real, he'd be about six foot six, six foot seven, weighing about 250 to 300 pounds. His body and face are all the same color, paper white, and he has a head full of jet black hair. The first time I noticed him in this form was last summer. I came home from a late night of partying while I fumbled with my keys to let myself in, something huge and white came and stood right in front of the door on the inside of the house so I could see him in the side light windows. I screamed. I told him to leave me alone and slide off the opposite way he came. I rushed in my house and locked my bedroom door like it would do some good. He really likes to mess with people, especially me. He likes to steal things and move them. He really likes to inhabit electronics. One night, I had some friends over to the house and we were in the basement. We kept hearing loud thuds upstairs. I was a little scared, but I assumed that it was just a cat. Only all the cats were out. I asked my friend Cody to please come and investigate with me and he agreed. We went to the first floor and found nothing strange, so we proceeded to the second floor. We heard an alarm clock going off in my parents' room. It was around 9 at night, no reason for an alarm to have been set. What makes it really weird is that it was my mom's clock and it was doing the alarm beeps. But my mom only wakes up to the radio and her clock is set for that. We both thought it was really odd. I turned it off and went back to the basement. Later, after my friends had left, I was cleaning on the first floor and out of the corner of my eye, I saw him move across the hallway and he went through the door and out into the garage. I noticed that on the closet door in the hallway, there was a coat hanger and it was swinging wildly. I called my friends and had them pick me up. There have been many more experiences in my house, and I'm still not sure if the man is evil and is there to hurt me, or if he just likes to play jokes and scare me. Either way, I ask him on a regular basis to leave me alone. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, when ghosts are not friendly. When I was a few months old, my family moved from Texas into a beautiful home in Louisiana. It was out in the country, and there were few houses that were close to us. At first, we were just renting it, but the man that owned it later sold it to us because the house went into bankruptcy. As far as I'm concerned, there was a baby and a mother. 
At night, my dad used to watch TV late at night. Sometimes he would hear me cry, or so he thought. So he would go check on me. It seemed to come from the other side of the house. But as soon as he would reach the hall, it would stop. Figuring I had just stopped crying, he would come to make sure I was okay. But when he looked closely at me, he realized there were no signs that I had been crying. It happened more than once, and I was never the one that was crying. He would try to sneak to my room, but there were always the same results. Sometimes I would even be sleeping in my mom's room, or not even home. It still always seemed to come from that side of the house, and it was a baby crying. Later on, I found out that my room and the hallway had been part of a totally different house that was moved to that location many years ago. A doctor had bought the house and added on to it. Maybe when I was three or four years old, my dad started working overseas. So there was only my mother, me, my brother, and my sister who were both teenagers. My sister's boyfriend would sometimes stay at our house. My mom moved me to the other side of the house in her room because I was terrified to sleep in my room. I always felt that something was watching me and I was also scared of the staircase, which I could clearly see from the doorway of my room. My mom would offer my sister's boyfriend to sleep in my room, but he refused. No matter what, he would end up sleeping on the couch. I loved to draw when I was little, and I still do. So we would put all of my drawings at the bottom of my closet. One day, Will, my sister's boyfriend, finally told my mom the reason that he wouldn't sleep in my room. And it was because one night he woke up and heard papers being moved. He got up and went into my room and saw papers floating in the air and being tossed to the side as if they were being looked through. Not only that, I had numerous wind-up toys and a laughing foam that would wind up in the night. The little girl, and I'm thinking it was a little girl, loved to play with my toys. One night, I had a dream that this little girl was my best friend, but no matter what, we would always play by the staircase by my room. She would refuse to go anywhere else. After a while, my brother and sister moved out, so there was only me my mom, and the ghosts. I knew there was a lady ghost, and I think she was the mother of the little girl. Because one day, my mom was going upstairs to clean my brother's room, and I saw a lady in a long brown dress standing on the staircase blocking her way. Also one night, I woke up to a creaking noise that was coming from my mom's room. When I walked into her room, the rocking chair was rocking back and forth. And when I went to see if the window was open in case the wind was blowing, it wasn't and there was an indentation in the chair, as if somebody was sitting in it, like the mother was rocking her baby to sleep. When I was in first grade, we moved, but we would come to the house on the weekends. Since we left, it was never the same. When we would come home, no matter what we did, it was cold, we even got a fireplace installed. We would come home, and it had gotten so cold that our plates were cracked, and my fish had died. The house just had a weird feeling to it, I missed the house, but for some reason, I just couldn't stay in it when we came to visit. I would always go to a friend's house. One night, I had a dream. My mom and I were outside, and all of a sudden, three men came up to us and tried to kill us. They looked Chinese or Vietnamese, and in my dream, our yard was a sugarcane field. Our house is actually built on what used to be a sugarcane field. The men made a box, and it seemed very important to them. Everything was a sugarcane field except for our driveway and a tree. The three men killed my mom and I and buried the box next to the tree, the one on the side of our driveway. I know what tree it was in real life, but we moved before I ever thought about digging there. My mom and I were talking one day, and all of a sudden she said that one night she woke up to what seemed to be a horrible fight. It came from the other side of the house, yet it seemed like it was happening right in front of her. From once she remembered, there were three men yelling and screaming killing the mother and daughter, just like in my dream, except it wasn't my mom and me. Whatever the men were screaming in, it was a language that was unknown to her. She pictured three men of an Asian type, maybe Vietnamese, and the truth was I had never spoken to her about the dream before. People that came to our house would hear whispering, see shadows, and they would also hear my toys being played with. They all said that it was coming from my room or the staircase. They knew the house was haunted, but if they were making up stories, how would they know that things usually only happened by my room? At first, my mom and I thought they were just two innocent little ghosts, but our minds were changed. As soon as my mom got the idea to get the house blessed 
and looked up the history of the house, our lives were turned upside down. We were forced by my dad to sell the house and many other things went wrong. When my mom and I thought about everything that had happened over the years, we began to realize maybe we were wrong about the ghost all along. Were they ever really nice? There was always bugs and snakes in and around the house no matter what. No matter if it was cold, nobody wanted to stay. They moved out refusing to stay. Everybody except for me and my mom. Doesn't it just seem a little weird that there was a mother and daughter ghost and me and my mom were the longest people to stay in the house? We finally moved and our lives seemed so much better. Even though it was a beautiful house, we will never live in one like it again. My mom and I have found a nice town in southern Louisiana, and we're just fine without a nice fancy house. I guess money really can't buy happiness.